Welcome to the 3C Live Experience, a dynamic, multiracial, fast-growing church with thousands of believers filled with passion for God and for people. Let's join 3C in this live experience. Proverbs 10 verse 22. Proverbs 10 verse 22. It says there, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. The blessing of the Lord. So what are we seeking for? The blessing of the Lord. That's what we need within our life. Not what we perceive to be blessing. We need the blessing of God within our life. And we might not know and understand what it is because we have not had exposure to it. But that's why we need the blessing of the Lord that makes one rich. So we want that grace. We want that favor. Who wants the hand of God upon their lives? Can I get a big amen there, right? But now with increased privilege and blessing comes increased responsibility. So God blesses you for a reason, for a purpose. In actual fact, in the book of Genesis chapter 12, he says, and uh, uh, as we receive the blessing of the Lord, he says that you may be a blessing and that through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Say with me, I am called to be a blessing and that through me, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Isn't that encouraging? Amen. Amen. So there's increased responsibility, not an increased right to more blessing. We're not looking for more blessing. We're looking to fulfill purpose. So with that comes the hand of God, the grace of God, so that we're able to do what we need to do. So James 1.17 says, every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above, right? So every good thing that we do receive is from the Lord. And um, he says, in whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, uh, he says in the message translation, God is not two-faced and he's not fickle. You understand? So we never have to worry. God is not a fickle God. What he promised is what he's going to give. So what sets apart privilege from entitlement is gratitude. Say to me, gratitude. And that's what we saw last week. Importance that we live a life of gratitude, of, of thanksgiving, and understand that we don't own anything, but that everything we have is a blessing of the Lord, it's a responsibility, and now we must be good stewards of that entrusted to you. You don't own your wife, you don't own your husband, you don't own your children. You don't own your business. I know you call it my business, but it's actually not yours. Uh, I know you say it's my house, but it's not my, in actual fact, the bank actually probably owns your house. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we can get to the place where we're entitled. No, no, we're good stewards. So is there ownership? Yes, but never for ourselves. You understand? Responsibility means you taking ownership for others, being a good steward of that which God has entrusted to us. And the reason we do that is for our seed. We don't live for ourselves, but we live for our seed and our seed seed. So it means seed seed. Okay, so it means children's children. So we don't live for ourselves. We live for those that God has placed around us and the generations to come. So it's not about you surviving. It's about you making the next generation survive. Turn to your neighbor. Say, it's not about your survival. Tell your neighbor it's about the next generation. You see, if you're about your survival, that's small mentality. It's about the next generation. And that's why God says, you know, now we've got to understand it's about the seed. And that's why we've got to have an attitude of gratitude. And we looked at 1 Thessalonians 5.16 last week, which says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Why? Because it is the will of God. What is the will of God? That you... Rejoice always and pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks. What is the will of God? Come on, I can't hear you. Say rejoice always. Shout it out. Say rejoice always. Shout it out. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. See, that's the difference between entitlement and grace, and privilege. Are you hearing me here today? 
just the fact we get up and say, thank you, Lord, I'm alive. Thank you for the breath that I have to breathe. Hallelujah. We're just thankful to be alive. And yes, you might have a little bit of a headache and a little bit of an ache. The older you get, you get more aches. Can I get a big amen there? You might have an ache ordered, but it doesn't take away the joy of being alive. Can I get a big amen there? So we are thankful. We rejoice. We pray. We give thanks always. Are you hearing me here today? And that's why we looked at Psalm 100 and verse 1, where it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. How do you exit that lifestyle of entitlement? How do you ex exit? You exit by entering. Exit and entering happen simultaneous. You enter into thanksgiving. Say so be thanksgiving. 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 Shout it out. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Thanks. Giving. You see, when you talk about thanksgiving, it's an action. And that's what we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 1. And we looked at that this week. Last week, we started on that. And I'm going to finish uh, on that word today. We're going to look at the lifestyle. We're going to look at a model. We're going to look at the church. We're going to look at, at Paul, how they modeled, how they modeled it. So this life of thanksgiving, thanksgiving is always an action. You can't, you can't enter by not doing anything. You can't feel thankful. You've got to be thankful. Okay, you're not getting me. You cannot feel thankful. You've got to be thankful. Your being, who you are, your life, it's an action. Are you hearing me? Yes. Say thank you. Demonstrate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. In your speech, in your actions, show your thankfulness. It's thanks. It's thanks. It's thanks. Giving. How do you enter through thanks? Giving. Thanks is followed by giving. For giving. For giving. It's a lifestyle. It's an action. It's shown by who you are and what you do. So you can say, I feel thankful. That doesn't mean you're thankful. It's shown through your action. You can sing, I thank you, Lord, but is it shown in your lifestyle? So let's look at Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and verse 2. It says, we give thanks to God always for you all. <laughs> for us, it's sometimes we give God thanks sometimes for some of you. <laughs> Hello. As long as you do something for me, I will be thankful to God for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I, you greeted me, I'll thank God for you. You never greeted me. Ha! I'm not going to be thankful. You see, we've got, a, we've got conditional. No, he says, I thank my God for you. He says, always. And for you, all. I thank God for everybody. Thank God for you and 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 for you. And those people who make your life tough, all they're doing is making you tougher. Hallelujah. I thank my God for you all. Shout it out. I thank my God for you all. Come on, get some action. Through you all. Hallelujah. All. <laughs> Amen. See, thank God for everybody. God has brought along your path. He says, making mention of you in my prayers. See, you can't pray for me and gossip about me at the same time. If you're writing this stuff about me on Facebook and you're saying, then I know you don't pray for me. And then I know if you don't pray for me, you probably also don't pray for anybody. Gossips are easy to put in a category. They're non-Christians. 
Because if you don't, if you gossip, it means you don't pray. Because you can't pray for somebody and put them down at the same time. Because then if you pray, it's not a prayer of faith. So you might pray for them, but you don't believe what you're praying. So if you did pray, it's not a prayer that God heard because it had no faith connected to it. Because you don't believe it, why? Because you're gossiping. Hello, somebody. Are you hearing me? On the subject of gossiping. Look, while I'm busy, I get reports, people, things get said to me. I had one pastor phone me and he said, have you heard a certain pastor? And he said, A, B, C. I said, no. I said, you're the first person telling me. And um, he says, well, what do you think? I said, what do you want me to think? (laughs) I said, where did you hear it from? Where did they hear it from? Where did they hear it from? Let's start there. And then here's the thing. I can't go ask somebody about it because then I'm a gossip. So I can go to my pastor and ask, Pastor, have you heard about what, and and I'm meaning being innocent. You understand? I'm not talking about being a gossip. Innocently going to somebody and say, you know, you want to solve it. No, when you speak about it, you're a gossip. So I didn't ask anybody. I didn't ask my pastor. I didn't ask, I didn't ask. You see, when somebody comes, the Bible says that two or three witnesses, you understand, when it comes, and a witness is a person that had a first-hand experience. In other words, you were there and saw it when it happened. That's a witness in court. If you come in a court and you say, so and so, I heard so and so, they chuck you out the court. A witness, the Bible says two or three witness, a first-hand witness. So all the Twitter, Twitter gossipers. Hello, somebody. So I leave it there. I leave it there. The person comes and speaks to me that, you know, God will sort things out when he needs to sort it out. If that person is at fault, it will come out. God will expose what needs to be exposed. But if it isn't, I'm not going to be a gossip and go slate another person's name by asking somebody, you know, what do you think of this? Have you heard? Just, what do you think of this? Hello, hello, gossip. It goes in the one ear. I write it off, finished, finished out. I don't accept anything that I have not firsthand experienced. Are you hearing me? When it's two or three witnesses coming to that point, bring me into, then I deal with it. Other than that, it's got to, it's none of my business. Turn to your neighbor, say, stay in your lane. lane. Turn to your neighbor, say, mind your own business. (laughs) Turn to your neighbor, say, don't be a busy body. (laughs) Tell your neighbor, be busy about God's work. Amen. Amen. Okay, so sorry, we didn't have that in the first service, but I just felt maybe there's some gossip. uh, (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen. So, how does it look like? We give thanks, God, to all making mention of you in our prayers. And then he says, remember. Nothing wrong with remembering, but... (laughs) We're not there to remember people's failures or people's sins. What do we remember? And it doesn't mean that these people didn't have failures and didn't have sins. They had issues. All of us have issues. But if we look at these people, what did, you, what did they remember? They remembered, number one, the work of faith. Work of faith means energized by faith. Faith means a dependence on God. That's faith. A dependence on God. So be dependent on God. See, that, 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 that's faith. Faith is I'm dependent. 
And here's the thing. Faith energizes you. So if you don't have faith, you won't have energy. When you're overwhelmed, it's a lack of faith. A lack of faith means a lack of dependence on God. It means God is not in your marriage. God is not in you trying to be, be, be the right wife, husband, children, finances, uh, ministry, wherever. You see, dependence on God means that God is in all my business. I need God. See, it energizes you. A dependence on God. Energizes you to the fact that we come to number two. He says there, he says there, a uh, 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 work of faith, number two, dependence, uh, sorry, a uh, uh, labor of love. In other words, everything we do is motivated by love. No agenda. No agenda but your growth and development. That's the labor of love. So motivated by love. So it's dependence on God, obedience to God. And then thirdly, he says, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I, I endure. I endure, no matter how tough it is, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm experiencing, and, 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 and it might look as if, you know, if everything is gonna end, yet in that situation, there's endurance, there's patience in hope. Hope is an expectation for the future. There's a positive expectation for the future, and I endure. It might not work out like I thought it would work out. It might not happen like I thought it would happen, and maybe there was a shock or two along the way, but in the midst, of this, I endure, I am patient in the hope, not of the government, not in the hope of my boss, not in the hope of the, uh, 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 the achievements of my company, but I am the hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So that me, dependence on God, Amen. obedience to God, Amen. endurance through God. Amen. Amen. So once again, that's a lifestyle of thanks, giving. A lifestyle of thanks, giving is that I remember prayer of faith. There's a dependence on God. I'm obedient to God. The energy is there and I'm in the midst of it. I am patient. That's a lifestyle of thanksgiving. Now, verse four says, I recognize and know that he has selected you. Verse five says that the gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, much assurance with great conviction and certainty that we might live an empowered life. And then I want to jump quickly down to verse six. Verse six. And I want to show you the practical lifestyle of a Christian. It says, now he's talking about the Thessalonians. This is Paul speaking in verse six. He says, and you became followers of us and the Lord. So it means us and the Lord. Followers of us and the Lord. Ultimately, every one of us are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can't say you submitted to God if you're not submitted to man. That's why Ephesians 5.21 says, Submit one to another in the fear of the Lord. There is no submission. If there's not submission to one another, there isn't submission to God. Your submission to God is shown in your submission to one another. That's why it says, as you become followers. So the first thing that we see about the lifestyle, point number one for this morning's message, in a lifestyle of thanksgiving, you'll see they became disciples. Say so me, became disciples. They became followers. Okay? So the Amplified Version says, imitators of us. The Greek word imitator Mimitai is the English word we derive the word mimic from. So we mimic, we, we, we copy in other words. We look at somebody's life. He says, you are a disciple. So the first thing you need to do if you want to grow, you need to be a disciple. That's why at church we make, make sure, make sure you are in a cell. Make sure you have a leader. Make sure that your life can be challenged. Make sure that your decisions can be challenged. Are you hearing me? Because you've got to think about where you are, where you are, otherwise your life can be a lie. How do you know your life is not a lie unless it is challenged? Are you hearing me? That's why you've got to become a disciple. You've got to become an imitator, an imitator of Paul and Christ. So 
Christ, but Paul was the flesh and the blood. Make sure you have a leader. Who's your cell leader? Who's your pastor? Who are you imitating? You got that? So Paul says, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, be imitators of me just as I am of Christ. In other words, it's a, a, a progressive, a progressive experience of sanctification by the Holy Spirit that moves us upward and, and brings us to a place of growth where we are going from glory to glory. Hallelujah. And that's what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. We are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. We are growing. How do we grow? By becoming an imitator. By becoming a disciple. Are you hearing me? You cannot progress until you become a disciple. So number one, be a disciple. What's a disciple? A disciple is someone that follows with the intent of learning. I had a preacher, listening to a preacher the other day, and he said to me, he said, as he said from the pulpit, he said, yeah, we must not use the word disciple in the modern age because the world doesn't have an understanding of, no, rubbish. The world knows exactly what disciple means. They know exactly what disciple means. And when we mean disciple, we mean it exactly, disciple. So you place a negative connotation and whatever who wants to place a negative connotation on that, that's, a, that's your business. When we're talking about being an imitator, it means being an, a, a disciple. It means I imitate, I, I follow with the intent of becoming, with the intent of changing. It's not just learning. It's the intent of becoming, but I model you as you model Christ. I'm not modeling your rubbish. You understand? I'm learning from your rubbish. I'm learning what not to do. So I'm not judging you for your mistakes. I'm learning from your mistakes. I still honor you, respect you, and submit. Amen? Secondly, having received the word in much affliction with joy, of the Holy Spirit. The second thing is they paid the price. There's a price to pay to be a disciple. I said, there's a price to pay to be a disciple. There's a price to pay to spend time with somebody. There's things you need to give up so that you can get. There's some relationships that you have to get out of your life that are toxic. And yes, you know exactly who I'm speaking about. The hours and hours of wasted time you spend with people. Talking about yourself, you know why you like it, because it's always about you. That's why you love those relationships, why? Because they accept you just the way you are. Please give us a break from who you are. Please help us, give us a break. Give the world a break. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God knows who you need to be. Why don't you spend more time with God rather than having everybody accept you just the way you are and you feel comfortable? I've never heard of somebody going to gym feeling comfortable. How do you develop and grow, become fit and become potent without pressure, with comfort and no sweat? and no hard work, and no sacrifice. What nonsense is that? So you want comfort just the way you are? Hey, first of all, this is not the church to be, and I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ, not 3C. This is not the place to be. Because God believes in you. God's got a plan for you. God has birthed you so that you can be a world changer, that you can be a history maker. They're sitting on the side, spectating, and gossiping and speculating. That's not what God has called you to be. God has called you to bring about the change and transformation in the world. That's who you are in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. But there's a price to pay to be a disciple. Make sure you're getting into cell. Make sure you're sacrificing the time and you're making the time to get to those who you want to imitate. 
Jesus says to his disciples, follow me and I will make you. The Bible says, and immediately they left their nets and they followed. You've got to follow. If your leader has got a prayer meeting at five o'clock, guess what? You're in the prayer meeting at five o'clock. If your leader says, we're praying for seven days, we're fasting, guess what? You're fasting for seven days. Now, it might be a first for you. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. Amen. It might not just be water. Maybe you'll just do it on liquids. In other words, you just, um, you, just uh, you know, take the steak, put it in the grinder and, <laughs> and drink it right now. I'm joking. Hallelujah. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Yes. You don't grow without your coach on the, the, the side saying, stop it. Don't do that. Finish. That's it. You want to go there. You can't. Hey, you know what? You want to be the world champion? You can't be running around while you're training, eating hamburgers and chips. This is your last chips. This is your last burger. I think I'm prophesying to somebody right now. <laughs> Amen. Who wants to preach? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, this is your last burger, your last chips. Hallelujah. No, 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 no. Amen. <laughs> Talking to yourself. I'm preaching to myself. Woo. I had a great burger yesterday. Shoo. <laughs> Looking at that burger and I said, Lord, with all the bacon and the, and the cheese and the meat. And I said, Lord, bless this to my body. <laughs> Woo. Yeah, praise the Lord. So there's a price to be paid to spend time with those that are you imitating. There's a price. There's suffering. When you turn, when you choose to serve Jesus, people persecute you. You know, when you get saved, you think, sure, it's so awesome, God said dumb. You think everybody around you is going to get saved. You know, all your friends that are struggling, like you are struggling, you think, yeah, they're all going to go. And then after a while, you think, nobody. They come to you at church once and they say, ah, bye. Are you hearing me? Not everybody's going to get saved immediately. Not everybody's going to do, not, uh-uh, uh-uh. There's a price to be paid. There's certain relationships that you might lose. Some of you might, you know, in this country, doing the Bible, you, you can even lose your job. That's where we're going. Religious freedom has been attacked within our nation by the government. So as a church, we need to stand. We need to start standing for what we believe. Can I get a big amen there? Amen. So yeah, you'll, 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 you'll get ridiculed. But the Bible says when it talks about tribulation, the Bible, the, the, the Greek word here, uh, uh, athlipsis, means intense pressure. But even amidst this intense pressure, uh, here's some news, there is joy. <laughs> even in the intense pressure, there is joy. <laughs> even in the midst of severe suffering, there is joy given to us by the Holy Spirit in much persecution with joy by the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. There is joy, no, no matter how difficult the circumstances. True Christians never lose their joy. Never. No matter. No matter what you're going through. We never lose our joy. Joy, hallelujah. Why? Because of the genuineness of our salvation. Isn't that incredible? It transcends. It transcends all affliction. You know, mere human joy, the, the human joy, when persecution comes, it dies. <laughs> That's human joy. Tough times, persecution comes, joy is gone. But you see, when it comes, the joy of the Holy Spirit will always rise above our circumstances and it will always grow. Rejoice always. Why? It is a fruit of the Spirit. Can I get a big amen there? Yeah. Amen. amen. So, became disciples, paid the price. Much affliction with, there was joy. Then number three, you go from being a disciple to becoming a disciple maker, right? Because look at what it says here. It says here, 
It says, you became examples to all. You became examples to all of those in Macedonia and, and Achaia who believe for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth. So what happens is we go from being worthy imitators of our leaders, worthy imitators of our leaders and God, and we move to the place where our own lives become worthy of imitation. When people look at you and say, I want to be like you. Not that you're trying to get people to be like you. But when you start inspiring your lifestyle, who you are starts inspiring others. You become an example, which means you become a disciple maker. The word example in the Greek means an exact reproduction. We become like br blueprints that other people can say, okay, that's what it, that's how, okay, that's what it means to be a husband, wife, uh, parent. Okay, you see. Now you become the blueprint. Are you hearing me? Yes. So now you become a disciple maker. And in your disciple maker, what happens? You start proclaiming the good news. Because when you're an example, you don't preach doom and gloom. Hallelujah. You preach the gospel. You preach the good news. Say with me, good news. Say with me, not bad news. <laughs> good news in Christ. Proclaiming the gospel for from you, the word of the Lord sounded forth. This is actually powerful. You know, in the Greek, it means to blast forth. When you're a Christian, you blast forth. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a blaster forther. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. We're a blaster forther. Amen. To sound forth with intensity. A blaring trumpet or rolling thunder, a bold, continual trumpeting of the gospel, of the good news. Wherever you are, what are you trumpeting? You're trumpeting faith and love and patience and endurance and hope. Not gossip and did you hear? And you know what? No, mind your own business. Are you hearing me? Sort your own life out. So they got, they, they, not gossip, sorry. They proclaimed the gospel. And what happened? They proclaimed it to all nations. Not only in Macedonia, but in Archaea. In every place. And you know what? It just happens because that's what happens with the fruit of obedience. There's just multiplication. You touch somebody's life, they touch somebody's life. And when you look again, you are ministering, you are ministering somewhere in Eastern Europe and you're ministering somewhere in Russia. Come on, somebody. You're ministering somewhere in the East. You're ministering in countries that nobody has ever heard of. You're ministering, ministering, ministering. And what has happened? You're touching people's lives. You're touching people's lives just because of who you are. Isn't that incredible? Just because of who you are, there's a multiplication of who you are. And then uh, 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 the next point is your life. He says your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Isn't that powerful? In other words, your life preaches. It preaches louder than your words. Your life preaches louder. Your actions preaches. Your life becomes a voice. That people look at you, they look at your family, they look at what you're going through. Not that everything's perfect and that everything's working out, but how you handle what's not working out. How you handle what you're going through. And people say, wow. You become a hero to people. You become an example. You become a blueprint. And that's what God has ordained within your life. That your life will shout louder. And that brings me to point number seven, which means your life becomes a personal testimony. In other words, you become the gospel. Why? Because you are portraying the evidence of a changed life. How you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And as verse 5 says, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power in the Holy Spirit and with great conviction. Say with me, in power. Say with me, in the Holy Spirit. 
in much conviction and absolute certainty. See, it's an empowered life. We talk about the power of God. The devil knows the Bible. He can quote the Bible. And he can preach as, best, as good as any charismatic preacher. The devil can even do miracles. But the devil cannot not lie. It's his nature to steal, to kill, and to destroy. See, so when we talk about the power of God, we're talking about the power of a changed life. And it's not that miracles won't follow those who believe, but first of all, you've got to believe. So the ultimate power is not in that which follows. The ultimate power is in a changed life, a transformed life. Are you hearing me yet today? You see, the, 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 the spoken word is not conveyed just through words but it's conveyed through the power of God. If it's not, if it's only words, even if it's truth and there's no power of God on it, it accomplishes nothing. But when the word of God is empowered from that person who is speaking into the prepared heart of a person through the power of the Holy Spirit. So a genuine soul transforming power through the preaching of the gospel as we speak a God word and now you have somebody that receives it in a godly heart. Now there's change and transformation that takes place and now there is a testimony. See, that's the evidence of a changed life. That's why we need God. So you can speak the truth. You can tell your children, you must be kind. But you've said that to them 231,000 times since they were one, they're now 18. And how's that been going? <laughs> Hello. So you can talk the truth. But if it's not saturated by the power of God, by faith, and your belief in God, no matter what you say, and if God has not prepared the person that needs to receive from God, doesn't matter, you can say it over and over and over to your husband, to your wife, to your colleagues, to people around you, if there is not the evidence of the power of God, there is no change, there is no transformation. You want your child to have an encounter with God. So there's gotta be preparation through prayer in the heart of your children. And then when you speak, you've gotta speak words that are seasoned with power. I told my children a thousand times, yep, you're gonna tell them another thousand. What do they need? An encounter with Jesus. Are you hearing me? So what we need is to take the word and God needs to give you a word for your children. Not God needs to give you a word for your husband. Not God needs to give you a word. Not what you want to say to him. God, what do you want me to say to him that will bring about that change and transformation? In other words, What's his need? What can I, with your wife, what can, see, not what I feel I want to say and I just say and I just talk rubbish. And then we just kill and we steal and we destroy. Are you hearing me yet today? Yes. And where does that come from? It comes from a life of thanks. Because <laughs> you think you know how to raise your children. <laughs> Silly you. Now it's too late. But thank God for grandchildren. Okay, so let's try part two. Can I get a big amen there? Yeah. You're hearing me? Don't feel all condemned. Don't feel all condemned. Mistakes we've made and stuff. It's, we make mistakes. Things like that. But change. 
And that's why I'm speaking to you today. We, we need today, we need an encounter with God. But we need to exit out of this entitlement I deserve. Why God does it? Why does it happen to you? Why does she have this? Why don't know? When you get the, if you got the promotion, I didn't get the. I stand that out. No, no, my car, no, 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 my skirt. Why, no, why everything bad happened to me? Well, guess what? You're going to be like that the rest of your life. And no one can help you. There's no, there's no salvation for you. Because you're the ruler of your own life. That's why the Bible says, if a ruler, Psalm Proverbs 29 verse 12, says, if a ruler pays attention to lies. All his servants become wicked. The New Living Translation says, if a ruler pays attention to a liar, he says, all the advisors will be wicked. In other words, you surround yourself. The people around you are wicked because they endorse your lie. And what we need is the truth because the devil is the father of lies. He's working every single day, 150% Got the demons on you working to create your will, to create the lie. That's what he does. And you got to decide. Remember, you got the choice. The devil can't decide for you, but God can't decide for you either. You're the ruler of your own life. If you pay attention to the lies, if you give it, if you give the lies credibility. That's why when a gossip speaks to me, I never give it credibility because I know who I am. So when I endorse, I know I don't endorse the lie. I don't accept the lie. The day I endorse the lie is the day that God removes His grace of my life. I walk in the fear of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? I respect God too much. I respect His pur- purpose of my life. I will not allow the, the lie to form my life. But what do I do? I enter into His gates with thanksgiving, into His courts with praise. Is this helping somebody? Sure. Time's up. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on. Be a disciple. Pay the price to be a disciple. In the midst of affliction, make sure you got joy. Become a disciple maker. That's the flow. Being a preacher of the gospel, the good news, not the bad news, and not the government newsletter. Can I get a big amen there? And by government, I mean all parties. I'm not choosing a party. And what the media says, that's not the newsletter. We take the word. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet just there where we are. Hallelujah. Let's become aware of the presence of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. Come on, with you are, just lift up your hands into the Lord. Just start worshiping the Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We honor you, Lord. Hallelujah. We honor you, Lord. Where we've been entitled, full of ourselves, murmuring, complaining. Forgive us, Lord. We need you within our lives, Lord. And today we come before you a thankful people. We thankful, Lord. We thankful, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love that you bestowed upon our lives. And Lord, we see what we need to be. And Lord, we're not there. Please forgive us. But Lord, that's where we, we want to be. That you have called us to be a You've called us to be disciples. You've called us to be disciple makers. You've called us to be influenced to nations. We will not settle for second best. We will not settle for survival. But thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the trust that you have in us, the faith that you have in us to accomplish your purpose within our lives in Jesus' name. So it be by the blood of Jesus, I am redeemed from the power of the enemy. By the blood of Jesus, all my sins have been forgiven. By the blood of Jesus, I am cleansed now and continually from all my sin. By the blood of Jesus, I am justified. And God sees me as though I've never sinned. By the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, set apart for God's purpose. 
thank you, Lord, that I am alive, that I have purpose, that you have called me to make a difference. Come on, give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Hallelujah! This 3C Live experience was brought to you by the 3C Media Production. For more information, call us on 86 112345 or log on to my3c.tv. Or you could write to us at P.O. Box 10508 Centurion 0046 or email us at tv at my3c.tv. If you need prayer, SMS the word PRAY followed by your prayer request to 33347 and our team of prayer warriors will pray for you for 30 days. If you would like to become a partner with the ministry, SMS the word PARTNER to 33347 and one of our team members will get back to you within the next few days. You can follow Pastors Bert and Shane Pretorius on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram to be inspired daily by morning devotions, ministry updates and much, much more. Log on to my3c.tv for more information.